The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, religion, and education. We'll explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Robert A. Williams, president of the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. Bob, glad to have you with us today. Always a pleasure to be with you, Roscoe. Now, I know you from the time you were a student at New York University and were captain of the NYU basketball team, and then you created the Sports Foundation. You've done so many leadership things in our community, but one of the most important has been helping in the creation of the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. So tell us what the Basketball Hall of Fame is about and what the history of the Hall of Fame is. Well, first off, I would uh, like the audience to know that uh, I met you in September of 1959, and we've been friends ever since, so that's 50 years. <laughs> in terms of the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame, uh, really uh, six guys named Joe in New York City from the athletic community, uh, myself, uh, Howard Garfinkel, Tom Konchowski, Bill Travers, Howie Evans, Ovin McBarnett and myself. We started it in 1990. And uh, we've uh, been having ceremonial services and inducting people ever since. And it was really designed as a, uh, New York City is the mecca of basketball for the, for the, for the, for the United States of America, and it's the model. And uh, we have Madison Square Garden, you know, and, uh, and uh, we felt that it was time to recognize the uh, people who really made the game great. You know, the game now is focused in Louisville and Indiana and on the coast and everything, but the game or originated here with the first uh, world champions of basketball being the Harlem Renaissance and with the great Pop Gates and John Isaacs, et cetera. And we thought that we would uh, do something that would commemorate all of those people and memorialize all of those people. And we had our first uh, dinner at Tavern on the Green and in 1990, and in that class, there was uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. In fact, the first person to go on was uh, Bob Cousy, mm -hmm. for the record. He was the first one to be inducted. And uh, if you look at it as a team, that backcourt was Bob Cousy and Dick McGuire. Mm -hmm. You had a center of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You had two forwards as uh, Adolf Shays and Billy Cunningham. And the other two forwards on that team would have been Connie Hawkins, and William Pop Gates, the, uh, the uh, contributor, because we have different categories. We have uh, the uh, coach of that team, or the initial team, was uh, Red Auerbach. Mm -hmm. The uh, contributor was uh, the legendary Holcomb Rucker. And we had a trustees award, and our first woman to go into the Hall of Fame was Ms. Zelda Spolstra. They called her the angel of the NBA. So that's the history, and, uh, and the rest is history. Well, the interesting thing about New York City and basketball, basketball was developed by James Naismith in 1891 mm -hmm. at my alma mater, Springfield College. Right. And in the 1930s, Ned Irish brought basketball to Madison Square Garden. Yes. And people began to see basketball outside of those small gyms. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, once the uh, pros started, it, and once television got there, everybody throughout the world knows about basketball. Mm -hmm. They know about the strategies, they know about the great players like Kareem and Michael Jordan and Bob Kilsey and so on. So it's really uh, appropriate that there be a New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. But as you were naming those people in that first class, that's like a Hall of Fame team <laughs> itself. Yes, sir. It, 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 uh, of course, the game has changed a lot. We'll talk about that a little later. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that that particular team that you mentioned with those people uh, could have beaten anybody in their time. Uh, and yes. it's uh, really appropriate. Now, the other thing about this is passing on history. Why is it important to pass on the history of the game? Well, you know, Roscoe, when you... you uh identified the game as uh, being starting in small gyms and whatnot. Well, the game, the game started before that. Mm -hmm. They started in, 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 in cages mm -hmm. where, they had, where they had a screen around the cage and the game was played there. And the reason they had the screen around the cage basically was because when the black players played against some of the white players, they wanted to separate them from the audience mm -hmm. so that there would be no violence because the Renaissance were usually winning those games. 
And that's why they call them cagers. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the origin of, of that mm -hmm. term in basketball. Uh, but uh, the, the uh, history of the game is that, um, you know, and there's a sociology to the game as well. You know, at first you had mostly Jewish players playing the game. Jewish and Irish. Jewish and Irish, yes, for, uh, certainly, and some Italians. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as the opportunities came in society and whatnot, they sort of moved on to be the doctors and lawyers and all the rest of it, and, and, uh, and it became an opportunity for blacks to play in the game. At first, uh, basically, we, there was almost an unwritten law that there was a quota. Where you'd have one or two blacks uh, playing on each team, and if they didn't start, you weren't sitting on a bench, you didn't play. Mm -hmm. And I think that our induction pattern in the Hall of Fame sort of uh, uh, I indicates that, that and reflects that, you know. So, uh, so I, th I think that, uh, and, and the style of the game, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the fastness of the game, the fact, the concept of the Renaissance where the ball never hit the floor coming up the court. It was a fast break game, the, uh, the pick and roll you know, playing the good defense. I mean, those, those are the fundamentals of the game that still stick today. But of course, uh, many people in the audience don't realize that when basketball first started, after every basket, the ball would come back to the, the center, ball, yes. and they would throw it up, and they'd have yes. a center jump. Yes. Uh, that carried on right on into the 30s. Yes, sir. And that, yes. of course, slowed down the game. So mm -hmm. a high-scoring game back in the 20s and 30s might have been 32 to 28. If that much. If that much. <laughs> and one yes. of the reasons why the New York Rens had won the first professional championship uh, kept the score low is they would pass the ball around. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe they'd pass it for three or four minutes before they'd take a shot. Yes. Yes. And most of the shots weren't jump shots. Where they, they didn't even do jumps up right. at that time. You From outside, they yeah. were layups. Yes. So the yes. game has really changed. And by having a Hall of Fame, where you memorialize this, this helps to keep those memories alive because, as they say, if you don't know where you have been, you don't know where you're going. That's right. And when you get there, you don't know how you got there. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the things about basketball, this great international game, a number of people don't know how we got there. And, of course, that raised some questions about who's going into the uh, New York City Basketball Hall of Fame in '09. Who did go in in the... September 24, well, 09. The September class. class, we had, uh, and you know, and we have a veterans committee, so we like to, again, honor the game and, uh, you know, and honor the uh, person, the people who really uh, set the game up, the foundation, who we stand on their shoulders. A gentleman named Sam Schoenfeld went in this year. He, uh, he was a great uh, star at Columbia University, he played with the day great uh, 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 Mr. Gregory. Uh, uh, George Gregory was the Gregory, first black All-American basketball first black player back in the basketball, And also with uh, uh, Lulu Bender. Mm -hmm. Lulu Bender went into the hall last year at the age of 98, and I'm so glad that he had a chance to smell his roses because, uh, sadly, we lost Lulu Bender this year. So, and, and we acknowledged that at the dinner this year. And... Um, uh, this is so so uh, uh, Sam Schoenfeld went in. We have uh, Armand Hill from uh, from uh, Princeton and the Boston Celtics went in. John Sally, uh, John Crawford went in, and Billy Schaefer from uh, St. John's went in, and also uh, Miss Whirl. Gail Marquis. Well, tell us about Gail Marquis. Uh, I, I, I certainly will, but I want to acknowledge also that the coach this year was uh, John Cress, and the uh, contributor was Spencer Ross. No, no, the contributor was John Andres, and the Special Trustees Award went to uh, Spencer Ross. Now, Gail Marquis is uh, rather dear to me because I, I've always felt that you know, women have played a part in the sport also. Gail uh, went to Andrew Jackson High School. She went to Queens College. She was a, uh, uh, an Olympian. They won the uh, bronze medal in 1976. And now she is uh, working on Wall Street as a financial advisor. Gail was very unique. And as I said, I, I saw her when she played in the original Women's Basketball League, which is the Women's Basketball Association. And she played for the New York Stars, who won the championship that year. And they were coached by a good friend of ours, Dean the Dream Memminger. Mm. 
so so Gail is, was very significant, and there and there are only three women in the Hall of Fame, the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame: Zelda Spolster, who I mentioned before, Nancy Lieberman, who everyone really knows, Nancy, and uh, and Gail Marquis, and the other the other women in the hall is Gail's uh, team that she played on at a at a Queens College. They went in at, they went in as a team several years ago. Yeah, it's very interesting because women's basketball went through some tremendous evolution. We talked about the elimination of the center jump changing men's basketball. But women's basketball up until the eighties they only could play one side one of half the court. Yes. defense, the other half offense. Yes. And in that time uh, small colleges like Assumption and Queens College of New York mm -hmm. became the best teams. Yes, old Dominion. And then when yes. the game opened up and they were able to move it around more like the men's basketball game, many of the state universities, mm -hmm. uh, particularly places like Tennessee with Pat yes. Summit and North yes. Carolina with yes. Kate Yao, yes. that changed the way in which women's basketball, and as it goes from college down to high school, down to junior high school to elementary, the skill level picks up. Mm -hmm. So now the skill level differential between men's and women's basketball is practically non-existent. Yeah, and the fact that somebody yeah. like Gail Marquis could be a great basketball player, a great student, a great community leader mm -hmm. is something that obviously should be recognized. And I would I have to say to you, I hope you're going to get a lot more women in the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame in the future. Well, they're coming, and I'll tell you, Russ, if you looked at that room the other night, they had about uh, almost half that room, women's room was filled with women, and the, and, the, and the dinner was sold out, and it was really sold out uh, basically because of Gail Marquis, mm -hmm. quite frankly. I mean, her whole team was there. Uh, they must have sold about eight or ten tables. Mm -hmm. So it was really great. Now, the other thing I think is very important about Gail is she points up the nexus between sports and academics. Mm -hmm something that you and the Sports Foundation mm -hmm. that you uh, helped to start uh, have advocated, uh, mm -hmm. building uh, social responsibility, social responsibility through, through sports, through sports yes, staying in school, getting your credit. Mm -hmm. Now, because of the way in which the professional leagues operate now where somebody can play one year of college and go into the pros or even mm -hmm. go directly from high school, mm -hmm. a number of very, very capable players really don't think about academics. Yeah. That, that is truly unfortunate. Because, as you know, it's only about one out of 10,000 that are going to get into the pros. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that they do need to get the education. And one of the things you do by honoring somebody like Gail Marquis, and by the way, all of the people that you talked about all have degrees. Yes. In, in the old days, yes. you didn't get out of school without getting a degree. That's right. And so most of the older pros were college students or college graduates. Now, because of the nature of the economy, you know, a young person who's very good can come out of college and make $10 million his first yes, year yes. or her first year. So that, that is a different part of our society. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of your presentations at these Hall of Fame dinners, to what extent do you try to stress and bring up the idea of social responsibility and academic achievement? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the things that we've done at the Hall in the past is, uh, uh, first of all, we, uh, we acknowledge the fact that the, these people, you know, were not one and done or two and done. They did four years and they got their degrees, number one. And secondly, one of the programs that we've had at the, f uh, in, at the Hall in the past was uh, the SAT prep for current high school students. We uh, have uh, chosen st students out of each borough to uh, and give them, given them a scholarship to the Kaplan School so that they can prepare for the SAT because uh, j just as we've had at, at the, you mentioned the Sports Foundation, uh, just as we had there, one of the things we have a standard. You know, if you're going to play, you're going to have to be eligible. And uh, a, lot of s a lot of our programs at the Foundation are non-varsity programs and it's done for a reason because we feel that the, s the varsity students are at least taken care of and given some guidance and advice uh, as, as uh, varsity athletes whereas our uh, non-varsity youngsters don't really get that kind of guidance. You know, you have about 1,200 students to one guidance counselor in the high schools today if not, if the portion isn't uh, more and uh, our youngsters don't really know what it takes to even be eligible to uh, go to school. They don't know about the academic clearinghouse. They don't know 
that uh, you know you have the, 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 what the requirements are to pass for the SAT or the ACT exam, and you have to do that. A lot of our youngs and a lot of our coaches don't don't send in that form 48 uh, 48H, where uh, a lot of our football players. Uh, when they go to school, have to redshirt the first year because they, the the coach hasn't sent in the uh, information to the NCAA to let them know that the courses that they've taken in the uh, in their respective schools are up to standard. Well, as um, you talk about New York City Basketball Hall of Fame, you talk about college players, you talk professional players, you talk about coaches. To what extent has the change in the economy and the society put different kind of pressures on players? and coaches. You read about scandals where, not so much gambling, but that probably goes on too, but where they have fudged their academic requirements. They have mm -hmm. substitutes to take exams. To what extent has the pressure of society and the money made a difference? And secondly, uh, what can we do to ameliorate some of those pressures? Well, I think first, uh, you know, uh, basketball is not only a national pastime now or, or one of the priorities but it's international it's a globalized uh, sport now and it's a, and it's a sport that has to be marketed so basically a youngster who goes to college is that that's basically the farm system they build up they build up name recognition in college and the pros want to pull them as soon as they can so that a lot of youngsters never get a chance to do the four years because their their motivation is to get in there build their name up, get their name recognition, and then become a first or a second round draft pick, which uh, at a minimum you're going to make two or three million dollars. And, uh, and, 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 and because it's globalized, a lot of youngsters now don't even, uh, they're not, they're, uh, their ambition is not even really the NBA. Sometimes it's just go and play in Europe, you know, and, and, and like that. So, so that, is, that is the first thing. It's, it's, a, uh, it, it's the uh, economy. A, a team that makes the NCAA uh, Sweet 16, that school is going to make several million dollars when they get a uh, when they get the television uh, game. So, uh, so these youngsters become commodities, and in the end, you know uh, what we say is, don't be a gladiator. Don't let the system use you. You know, go get your degree so you can become a productive student. You know, clearly, if you break an ankle or break a leg or, or, or have an unfortunate incident, oftentimes your marketability goes down and without a degree you really have nothing. That's not really so surprising. Uh, but how do you resolve that? Talking to a youngster, remember we've been around a long time, we know the old standards. Talking to a youngster who says, I need to spend more time, and the coach makes him spend more time, weightlifting, running, shooting, and I don't have time to do my academic work, and I'm going to make uh, several million dollars. At least I need to have the chance to make that. And many of the people who are saying that the rules that say they have to stay in school are unfair because it breaks the economic opportunity. How do you counter that kind of argument? Well, you know, as, as I started to say, uh, you know, let something unfortunate happen to you and, uh, and, and, and you're back on the street if you don't have that degree. And the second thing is, you know, uh, a, a lot of youngsters don't know how to uh, maneuver, you know, uh, a, as you mature, how to actually uh, uh, maneuver their way through this system, uh, you know, because without, without the uh, economics being in place, uh, the, the, all the rest of the dreams are shattered or there's no dream. There's, there's a nightmare. And, and it takes uh, good advisors. You know, and even when the youngsters make the money, Roscoe, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, they got three, uh, three cars, they got 400 pair of sneakers and 300 pair of shoes and whatnot, and they don't invest their money. And uh, in the end, or it's, it's a tragedy, but we call them disposable heroes in the end, particularly those who get hurt. But there is a new business developing. There are many people who come out of backgrounds like the Sports Foundation and other organizations that try to help these young men and young women because they are role models. Yes. Regardless of whether they have a degree or not, they are role models. But as you say, many of them, in fact, all of them are very young, mm -hmm. and many of them don't have the experience or the background to know how to handle the fame, the money, and the responsibility. So it is important that someone who's more mature, has the experience, work with them. Uh, to what extent, however, does the general society 
see these athletes as gladiators or did he see them as student athletes? I think that uh, mostly most people see them as gladiators, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know and, and oftentimes youngsters uh, come from single parent families. Often it's a, it's a mother. And she is uh, basically so in a mood with the fact that she will see her son or daughter's name up <laughs> in lights, etc., that uh, that that it'll get past them, and uh, the, the proper guidance is really not given. You know, uh, there's a youngster uh, who's with the Giants now, uh, rookie, went to Polytech, uh, uh, named Ramses Barden. You mean California Polytech? Yes, yeah, California Polytech, Ramses Barden, number 13. And I know his father well. We were teammates at NYU. And I know, for example, Ramses has his feet squarely on the ground because Al has made him mm -hmm. do so. And his, and, and, and his mother, Denise, is in the financial business, and they are really w very well-grounded youngster. And with that, you also don't get the, uh, the, the thug-type attitude. You know, mm -hmm. and this, this is a youngster who I predict will go very far because he's a personable youngster. He's, re he's reality-based. He's in a very tough sport, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I wait to see him go across the middle a couple of times and take the shots mm -hmm. and see if he gets or dusts himself off and, and move on. But I think that he's a youngster who will give back to the community, mm -hmm. who, who mm -hmm. will associate with the community-based organization, who will come and let youngsters know that it's not just sports, that, and, and also that sports and drugs don't mix, and, uh, you know, and, and, and move forward in, in, in that way in a positive sense. Well, talking about the sport itself, you've been involved in this for over 50 years. How has basketball changed, and what part of it, the change do you like, and what part of it are you concerned with? Well, I think that uh, if we go right back to the Wrens and the uh, CCNY uh, double championship team and whatnot, that's when you see a team, those teams that play fundamental, good fundamentally sound basketball. They what are. is good fundamental basketball? Well, you understand what a pick and roll is. You understand, un understand that the game has to be played inside out, that you have to have a pivot game before you can have an effective outside game, that you pass and go away from the ball, that it's not just dunks and, uh, and, and highlight films. You know, uh, people have asked the question, you know, uh, who, uh, who was the best player? I've been asked that question. You probably were going to ask me before it's all over. Who's the best player I ever saw? And I, and I will tell you that the player that, that most impacted me was uh, Oscar Robinson. I thought that Oscar Robinson did everything on the court fundamentally sound. You very rarely ever saw our, our Oscar put the ball behind his back or through his legs. But Oscar understood that to do all of that is the, the only purpose for doing that is to change direction. So you, so you could do it all in front, see the game in front of you. Oscar was able to take a person. I mean, he's a guy that, that averaged a double-double. And then, and then triple double, uh, yeah, yeah, triple double, <laughs> right? For a career, so you know he was doing an awful lot of things right. And then on the and on the other side of the coin, you have a Michael Jordan, and and uh, who who we, most people now are are, are more uh, 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 familiar with. But but the bottom line is that Oscar did it on the ground. Michael was the best to do it in the air, as far as I was concerned. But they were, in, in my estimation, equal talent and had equal impact on the game. And finally, what do you think has been the major impact of New York City on basketball and basketball history? Well, I think that uh, just the fact that we understood that the, the game originated here. I mean, it certainly originated in Springfield, you know, at your, at your college. But the game originated here, and the attitude has always been, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a low-budget sport. Everybody could participate in the sport. Uh, all of the innovation, most of the innovations came uh, from the sport, uh, for the sport here in, in New York. And then also a lot of our talent uh, has gone out and spread the word. I mean, wh one of the things that, that we do in terms of our criteria at the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame, you have to have been born, uh, have gone to school uh, in the Board of Education here in, in, in the... Uh, in, or the parochial school. In, in, yes, in, in, in the New York City area, but or in the five boroughs, I should say. But, uh, like, take a guy like Al, Al McGuire, he, although he went to St. John's and et cetera, he uh, 
we would not have made the hall because of what he's done in New York. And the Hall of Fame of New York City basketball owes a lot to Robert A. Williams, president of the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. Thanks for discussing this with us today. Take it's care, Bob. My pleasure, Ross, always, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm.